this is strobilanthes rachiensis and strobilanthes are brilliant i don't know whether you can see but the flowers are shaped like a tuber so that is not the tuber that goes in the ground that is the tuber that you blow and make a, a sound out of so. <laughs> this is one of my favorite plants ever and it's called Lespedeza thumbergii and Rosie describes it as a herbaceous shrub. It's quite amazing. This is possibly like the best way of encapsulating the vibe of this podcast, that gradually you're just getting more and more flowers into your hair. <laughs> And welcome to episode 64 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking very demure on this windy autumn day, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And absolutely blossoming down in Cambridgeshire, we have Thordis Maria Sophia Fredrickson. You're looking absolutely lovely. I love your top. Is it a top or a dress? It's a whole dress. My Just God. Tuned in flowers. It's flashing out. And it has pockets. Oh! Us gals and possibly guys do love well, a dress. I was going to say, pockets. it could be a garden visiting dress because you could have capacious pockets for nicking cuttings. <laughs> Would I? No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we may come on to the fact that Alan's been taking lots of cuttings over the course of this podcast. It's been a busy morning at East Ruston Old Vicarage, but mm. we should introduce our lovely guest, the lovely Lucy Slater of Johnny Crow's Garden. I mean... This Instagram page is what you should look at if you need to cheer up, if you need to be filled with joy. It is absolutely full of the most colourful flowers. Lucy, welcome to the podcast. And um, do you have a middle name to share? It's Jane, plain old Jane. I wish it was something more gorgeous. But no. <laughs> and any reason for the Lucy or the Jane? Were there stories there? Oh, God, I wish there was. No, <laughs> just... Jane, Jane, let's leave Well, I tell you what, never mind reasons for your name. What about reasons for the Johnny Crow's Garden bit? Okay, so that is an old book. So this book that I found in the tip, oh God, I'm trying to think how many years ago. It was quite a long time ago. And I wanted a, a flower shop years ago. And I just had this imaginary, this idea that I was going to have the book as the, the name of the shop. And I was thinking of merchandise. And I was, oh, God, it was just a wonderful book. And it really inspired me. And then um, I came here to Witheridge, which is the village we live in now, 15, 20 years later, created the garden, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to resurrect, resurrect the name. This lady in the village said to me, why do you call yourself Johnny Crow's Garden? And I said, well, because I really like it. This is his book, blah, blah, blah. And so I got a phone call about three days later from the son of the gardener of Johnny Crow's Garden. This book was written in 1900. There you go. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And, and it's not far away, just down, down the other side of the village. What did they say in the phone call? It was just, it was more like, you've heard of this book because nobody had heard of the book because it's out of print. It's been out of print for years and years and years. It really shouldn't be. It's an amazing little book. It's really charming. The most beautiful illustrations. And what resonated with me was, it was a little crow who loves parties and loves gardens. And it had a sort of Alice in Wonderland, dreamy sort of quality for me. So, it, all sorts were firing off in my mind and I just loved it so it was really strange and coincidental that that story ended up back here in this really small little village in Witheridge so there you go I love that do people think you're called Johnny though yeah they do and that's great <laughs> I do not like it it's better than Jane <laughs> I quite like the uh, kind of androgynous nature, therefore, that it's a bit like with when I contact people, they generally don't know if I'm a man. And I quite like that. They, they don't quite know who they're dealing with. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. I quite like it, too. I'm, I'm quite happy for people to call me Johnny. I think it's rather. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, of course, I mean, Alan and I, we follow so many increasingly, you know, wonderful Instagram pages that are full of floral inspiration. Bridget Girling has been on this podcast many times, dear friend of ours who 
it is floral artistry, isn't it, Alan? It isn't the kind of when we say florist, it's it's adapted into something which is just an expression of emotion and artistry that's completely otherworldly. I think the artistry bit is, is the thing that actually sells it to me because I do believe that it is an art. I mean, you can either do it or you can't. Now, when I looked at your um, some of your pages, Lucy, I was absolutely blown away because I don't think that um, have you had anyone recently use colour as um, as boldly, perhaps, as you do. Um, oh. and I, I, I just find that so refreshing. I mean, the knockout, pow, wow, what? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of feeling, I think, is terrific. I've actually got something here, which I don't know whether you've ever used in your in your floral art. Can you see that? Oh, that's beautiful. No, I haven't, but those colours are beautiful. Now, that's a soft palette. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's from an Echeveria, and the Echeveria is called Mona Loa. And it's named Mauna Loa after a Hawaiian volcano because it has all those kind of, sort of ashy and fiery colours in it. And I just think it's so lovely. I was, yeah. As Zorda said earlier, I've been taking cuttings and these things, they grow like a cabbage on a stick. And then when the stick gets too tall, you have to lop the heads off and, you know, put the, put the stem down into the ground again low, at lower level. Um, and when I do that, I have to take the flowers off. And this is what it is. You know, it's just such a, a nice thing, I think. So talking of cabbage, I do grow cranberries here and I do get that huge explosion yeah. of white flowers. And that would be lovely. I'm, I don't do weddings because that would be wonderful for a wedding. Um, so I, I'm a gardener, really. I've been gardening for 30 years now. God. And so I, I like colour and I like using colour. And, yeah. I, and I think that probably shows in the fact that I actually don't have a favourite. Everything, every season is a different favourite. But I do love some of these accounts that I follow, which are really soft and beautiful and delicate. But I'm a great big six foot. I fall into everything. Loud and proud, darling, loud and proud. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not delicate. And I admire hugely the delicate accounts. And I think they're very, very beautiful. But um, I've given up trying. I have tried and I've given up. <laughs> no, I'm, I like to just throw it all in there. So you grow, obviously, a lot of the material you use. You are kind of predominantly a, a gardener, grower, uh, and also artist. And um, so do you find yourself kind of pouring over seed catalogues and plant lists and things, trying to see what new punchy colours you can add to your, your cutting garden? I do. <clears throat> I do. Um, I think for the last two years, what I've been doing is developing very, very difficult land. So we have um, about nine acres here. And about four of the acres are paddocks. And that is what I'm gradually developing. Now, it is, there's about that much subsoil, no topsoil, and the rest of it is heavy, heavy clay. So I, what I've actually had to do over the last two years is create lots of raised beds so that in the winter time, the ground isn't absolutely sodden. And um, so I'm doing lots of annual flowers, really. So lots of pretty much every annual flower you can imagine ha I've had a go at. <laughs> the more complicated plants, I haven't really invested in too much yet because it's about time and it's about what my land here will allow. Um, I, I've had some disasters and I've had some, and I've had some um, successes, but um, it's all about learning really. And at the moment I'm, I'm creating another three quite large beds exclusively for roses. And I'm hoping because there's no room left for where I know the roses will be safe over, to, over winter. So what I'm doing is I'm putting these new rose beds in what I call iffy ground, because in the winter it will get waterlogged. We have huge amounts of waterlogging. People think I'm exaggerating, but if you were to come here in the winter and stand behind polytunnel tunnel number one and just stand there, you will hear water under your feet. It's incredible. So actually, for me, trying to, it's a balance of, growing things which I know will do well here. Um, and I think over the next few years, I'm going to be trying out different things. But at the moment, it's quite, it, it's about saving my money. The amount of disasters I've had with planting trees. I put willow trees in because it's a waterlogged place. But of course, what happens with heavy clay is in the summer, it totally dries out and it becomes a desert. So my willows fail. Um, and so everything, all my trees are on little hills now. 
little hillocks so that they can get their roots down and then they can cope with the water logging and then in the summer they're they're okay as well so it, it's a it's a steep curve and I whenever I go to people's gardens in this beautiful soil oh my goodness <laughs> I had beautiful soil, I'd be the best gardener. <laughs> well, you should, come and, you should come and visit East Rusnell Vicarage because we have the best soil. And it's what's known in, in the farming business as grade one agricultural. So, I mean, it's a light sandy loam, it's free draining. Um, it's all the things that probably your soil isn't. But one thing I would just say to you is that roses do particularly like growing in clay soils. So providing they don't not, they don't get too waterlogged in the winter or there's some way of draining some of that water away, I think you're going to be very successful with them. We're, we're getting there. I've got lovely, lo beautiful roses hopefully coming. But I'm particularly keen on some of these roses that I've really learned about through Instagram. So I've got Honey Dijon and Belle Epoque. Um, Belle Epoque is the most fantastic colour. Yeah, especially it's the back of a bell pop which is the most fantastic color it's the way it, it's one thing in the middle and then it's another thing on, on the outside and i love that i also love coco loco although actually funnily enough a girl friend came around the other day and she looked at my um coco loco she went oh they're horrible they make me feel sick some colors do push people into difficult areas why catherine there's a little iris in the spring catherine and Kodjkin. have you seen that one yeah yeah Beautiful pale watercolor blue, but a few people I've who've been at the garden and look at mine and get oh I'm not sure about that. It's very strange. Certain colors. I think because it has a lurid quality about it because it's got it's got that dirty sort of white and lurid sort of green and and the yeah. blue in there and there's an awful lot of white with it. I mean not clean white but dirty white with it. And I think because it looks like that. There's a, there's another one that's very similar. I can't remember the name of that. Um, but it's um, it is just one of those things. And Coco Loco is another one, which you've yeah. just the rose Coco Loco because it does look. I find that colour fascinating. To me, it looks like old parchment. Yeah, to other do. people, it, it looks like sick or something. I don't know. Um, it, it just puts them off. I personally you, love it. If you've ever noticed this, but if you, cre I've created a few gardens before, and I've put all sorts of bits and bobs in. And if I'm working with clients who are new to gardening, they like obvious colours and mm. they like obvious shapes and form and texture. If you put anything unusual in, I've noticed they're not so keen. It takes, as you develop in horticulture, it takes a certain eye to suddenly appreciate the more unusual plants and more unusual colours. I think that's partly, you know, that's what, when I get people who come here, get, oh, I don't like that colour. I think it's possibly because then new to flowers or or not um, as experienced in color yeah i think you have to grow into those sort of colors yeah. um and you have to be slightly odd about your color palette yourself <laughs> perhaps i don't know well i mean <laughs> it's, it's interesting totally. it's interesting i think um euphorbias are a plant family that you kind of grow into i remember walking around gardens even when i was sort of a couple of years into gardening with friends who weren't into gardening at all and I'd just say oh look at that amazing euphorbia and they'd say that's really ugly that's really weird I don't like it at all and um yeah. and you generally see euphorbias in the gardens of people who clearly love plants when especially in an area where I live where not not that many people are massively into gardening you sort of see very few euphorbias in certain gardens um but I do love Lucy how honest the people who come to your garden are <laughs> <laughs> They are. I've got some really honest friends. I remember my friend's mother came and she said, I really want to have a look around your garden. So our main part of the garden is sort of late borders. And she was loving it all and seeing how nice it was. And then she went, I took them through to the cutting area and loved all the usuals, the cosmos and the salvias. And everything. anyway, she got up to the dahlias and she went, oh, I hate dahlias. And of course, I've got a lot of dahlias, so it was, I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to take that. But um, yeah, I've had a few of those. There's one way to take that, Lucy, and just turn to her and say, well, honey, that's your problem because you're missing out. <laughs> well, absolutely. There's this, there's this thing about dahlias. When my mother was young, dahlias were really not fashionable at all. My mother used to, my mother was a bit snobby and she would say that they were allotment flowers. Now I love allotment flowers and now they've gone all the way around and everybody loves um, a dailies and I think they're brilliant and wonderful, but plants go in and out of fashion. Yeah. For example, campus grass was really out of fashion and now 
especially in floristry, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And there's lots of different varieties. I don't know the varieties, but there's a, a pink one as well as a white one. And yeah, it's just interesting to see how, how because I'm so old, I've watched fashions go up and then down. Like when I was in my 20s, it was very fashionable to have dried flowers. And then because of it, dried flowers suddenly became out to my mind and I think were well, out of fashion. And now the younger generations are bringing dried flowers back in again. And I'm finding it quite hard to embrace the dried flower because I remember pot pourri in the 80s and how dusty and horrible it was. But it is lovely to see the next generation um, embracing and uh, dried bringing it back perhaps with a touch of originality because that's what usually happens, isn't it? A fashion... Um, let's take the mini skirt or hot pants or whatever. You take those and they then they come back into fashion, but they're not the same as they were 30 years ago. So no, there's no, always no. that little twist. And 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 I think a similar thing to what Athordis was saying. You can actually go along and look at I don't know 16 front gardens in suburbia, and there'll be one that stands out. Whether it is the euphorbia or something else, another plant, but it will stand out. And it will stand out because you suddenly look at that. If you're a gardener, that is, you'll look at it and you think, gosh, that person knows something. And he's got that growing in his garden or her garden. You know, it's 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 that's the way it is. Yeah, yeah definitely. Euphorbias are absolutely one of my favourites. I, I think they're wonderful and I can't get enough of them. So actually, I think more people need to grow, you, grow euphorbias because there's so many varieties, as you know. Mm. Um, I'm particularly keen on uh, polychroma and palustris. I grow that in, in the spring. It comes up with uh, Camassia lectinii. And I love that combination in the spring. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Do you grow euphorbia? Oh, the, the, annual, the annual one. Do you grow that? Well, it's, it's the kind of thing that you only need one plant of because once you've got had one plant, you'll have it forever. Um, and I have to say that because... Um, I've seen it sold as as plug plants at fiendishly expensive prices. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, well, I've got a load I can dig up and, and you know, move around and all the rest of it. Um, it is a lovely thing. And um, it's so good for picking that lovely acidic lime green and yellow and acid and all of those yeah. things. So and good. And actually, Palostris goes the most beautiful autumnal orangey red. Well, very, very just means of wet places, so it should love you. It does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used, to, I used to have palustrus in my mum's garden, and I don't have it here, and I keep meaning to add it because it, we used to have um, Abu Hassan tulips that would yeah. come up through it, and it was just such a lovely combo. I'm missing that in my life. Yeah, you, yeah, definitely get that. And also the red, is it Griffithia? Is, the, is that the red? Yeah. Before? There's that two forms of it. There's uh, Euphorbia griffithii dixter and yeah. another name for it. Fire glow? Fire glow, yeah, yeah that's right. Fire glow, there's that's very little to change to, to, to between them, really. I mean, it doesn't matter which one you grow. You'll still get that lovely orange colouring. And I saw that, uh, I saw a combination of a, a spirea that has young foliage, brilliant, rusty, orangey, rusty colour, rusty yeah. orange parrot tulips, and that euphorbia, and that was at uh, Wallerton Old Hall, which is a garden in Staffordshire. And if ever you get the chance, either of you two young ladies, if you get the chance to go and visit it, you should, because it is, um, it's, I think, one of the top gardens in the country. Really, really. Um, I do love seeing combinations. And I think that that's the most wonderful thing by going into different gardens is just seeing, you might only take away one thing, and that will be, I like this and this and this together. And I love that. Mm. Yeah. Part of gardening, really. And also how many of them weren't planned. That's one of my favourite things, how or, or possibly you you intervene and you kind of created it, but you didn't know it was going to happen or Mother Nature just did it all. I had a lovely, I put a helichrysum in next to a self-seeded Michaelmas daisy. And so I've ended up with this lovely glowing orange helichrysum and the lovely purple kind of red scented aster. And it's a great combination. And I did not plan it. <laughs> it just happened. No, it's a little accident. Sometimes yeah. they, they produce some of the best things that happen in gardens. And, you know, the other thing is when you talk, we're talking about self-seeding plants, sometimes the plant will self-seed right where you just don't expect it at all. I mean, I've got the splenium, the heart tongue, heart's tongue ferns. They're growing in my front doorstep. Would I clean them out? No, they chose <laughs> to grow there and I love them for that. I think that's, that's terrific. Yeah. It's terrific. I love ferns, actually. The other thing I love in the spring <clears throat> is... Um, 
uh, forget me nots everywhere. I just love them, billowy soft blues. And I, I actually I split them at this time and then put them all over the garden so that I get that that one knitted colour of blue going throughout. Mm. And the other thing, talking of which, is have you noticed that in garden centres now you can buy the red campion, Celine? I forget yes, it. Yes, Celine. It's ridiculously expensive, and it goes everywhere. And it's, to me, it's like, yeah, come here. I can give everybody loads if they want. <laughs> you get these mysterious things. Alan and I have, have talked about this before, how expensive Serenthi seeds are. I don't know if it's because they're big, and so people think when they're selling them, they look impressive in a packet, but you get hardly any for your money, and yet if you have a plant, you will have a carpet of it. Yeah, no, it's very, very true, actually. I have hundreds of them, absolutely hundreds. And they originally came from one packet. And in fact, I've just finished collecting the seeds from the garden um, a couple of days ago. And I probably have enough to fill 20 envelopes. <laughs> that gives you an idea of just how many. So yeah, it is great. Well, if you need to top up your income, start selling the Serenthi seed because it fetches a lot of packet. <laughs> Gary's forever telling me you ought to be selling those. You ought to be selling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I know, lurking off screen, you've got some very exciting show and tell because you sort of pre-podcast chat it dashed into picture and then out again. <laughs> so we got this brief flash of what was coming up, and it looked absolutely beautiful. So, what have you brought along to talk about today? Oh, I, just, I think I'd pick some. I don't know if you can see it actually. I thought I'd pick some autumnal colour. Um, I did a bake, um, an arrangement yesterday, so it was what was left over, and I just wanted to show you, look at that autumnal colour. Doesn't that just sum up autumn? Lovely. Yeah. It is lovely. So um, most florists will know all of these anyway, but I just thought I'd show you. So that's Rebecca Sahara. I just wanted to talk about the colour. Oh, my God. Isn't that beautiful? Love it. Yes. I really love about flowers, and is how many colours you can get out of one flower. So look at that. It's wonderful. And then we got the cherry brandy. Oh. She's lovely. And then um, and then I, I love my creamy, my little queen. I just love zinnias. <sighs> when I found the size of zinnias, when I was, I don't know, much, much younger than I am now, I thought they were the most magical flowers I've ever seen. Look at them. <sighs> Zinnia love, like me. Look at that, she says. Look at them. Oh, there are, so, can... so what ones do you grow? Because actually this was a question that came up on our most recent post bag edition was uh, suggestions of zinnias to grow. Because obviously there are several different types um, and they're oh. all very tempting. These are definitely my favourite. These are the queenies. So you can get queenie red, queenie lime and orange and all sorts. And they're the ones that I really, really love because of your, it's, they've got so many different colours in one flower so that's they're kind of hard to believe i think like a queeny red lime which i think i love the most of all of that series you you cannot believe it and the great thing about zinnias is how the flower develops so it first opens and it looks completely different to how it looks at the end so yeah. it's just this exciting adventure in one bloom and they are so beautifully long lasting yeah i mean the petals are tough they're more more like brats and they are petaloid yeah. things and, and yeah. i think that's probably why they last such a long time. Yeah. yeah, and for me, because I also sell them as uh, jam jar um, flowers at the end of our drive. So for me, they're great anyway, because they look wonderful and they'll last forever. So those are my Rebe Rebecca's. I just want to talk about a few other things which I particularly love at the moment. Look at this. Look at the. I love the way these, the geranium, they smell like gin. I can't remember which variety it is but I absolutely love these leaves oh. Don't you? they're really soft and velvety um and I've just got them in a bucket I think they came with something else um which I then planted and they stayed in the bucket and they've been in the bucket for about growing in the bucket for about um three years but I absolutely love those and then I've got Persicaria red dragon oh. I think she's more beautiful now when just before she drops her leaves, then when she's actually just red and lovely in the summer. And then I just love, um, these are still bees. Look how lovely. And oh, yeah, I think that's beautiful. 
I love that. And a little bit of bracken. Nothing special with bracken, I know, but when you put it all together, oh, so nice. <laughs> Coleus, this is a bit floppy now. Ooh. I do now, really not a good show and tell example. Outside, I could give you something far better than that. But I love Coleus this year. I've been buying it from places like, um, well, supermarkets, and then just bringing them on and making and putting a bit of chicken manure with them. And they've been huge and wonderful. And I have about 10 um, large terracotta pots full of coleus, which will be the last thing standing when it comes to colour in this garden. <laughs> they are wonderful. And you know what? I don't, I never realised. So I'm going to reach over to my... It's gone, it's gone over a bit now, really. But I've had this on my windowsill, which is actually too bright for it. But I never realised... Having never having having thought of them predominantly in my head as a foliage plant, how fantastic the flower spike can be, and yeah. um, and these look they're more lilac in real life, really, and they've gone over a bit. But I mean, just they are unbelievable plants. I'm going to grow loads more coleus next year. This one is a terrible <laughs> name, chocolate covered cherry. Nice. <laughs> I think everybody should realise. They're quite easy to grow from seed and they'd love to grow in shade. Oh, the coleus, so, yeah. 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 They they'd love they love shade. So if you want to have a, a power or an impact, you know, wow, wow factor in your garden in a shady spot, bung in some coleus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Top tip. So one more thing. This is a thylactrum, um, Ellen. And then yeah. yes, it's the, it's the tallest one. I why I love this is in the summer. The leaf is lovely and Glauca bluey grey, which is beautiful. And then it turns to this. Look how it holds onto the green in the middle. It just is beautiful. So to me, that's that's just lovely. So that's what I got out of the garden this morning. Um, I could have been a little bit cleverer, but I just think these colours are wonderful. And they really sum up now. I think you were clever enough. Um, also, I mean, the, the Rudbeckias, all, again, another one that's really easy from seed. And then I generally find, you know, you grow them, you put them in the garden, you sort of forget about them and they come back and they just bulk up and get stronger and lovelier every year. And you get such a lot of variety, you know, this this one family and you can get things like um, Sahara or cherry brandy or um I don't know if you've had, I saw something in an arrangement that looked a lot like Irish eyes. I don't know if it was yeah. the one you had, but that kind of green centred one, really bright yellow, um, but with a green heart. Just what yeah. a variety. Really beautiful. And another one that can just last forever and ever, which I think is marvellous. I've got one more show and tell, actually. So um, last year I got very excited about colour. I thought I am going to really plough colour into the garden and be really clever. Mm, right. So I ordered some um, some corn, Indian gem corn. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so I just thought, oh, my God, I'm going to do bouquets. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to make incredible things with them. So I got the, oh, it was just like Jack and the Beanstalk. Like, so they came in this packet in every single kind or different colour, mauve, blue, you name it. So exciting. Um. They were growing brilliantly this this year, and they got to this stage, yeah. and then they ripened on the top. Can you see? Yeah. But they never any fatter than this, and if you open it up, the, they were just stayed white inside. Oh. I did everything correctly. Why do you think I didn't get my lovely, colourful gems? I think you, it's lack of sunshine. Do you think that's all it is? Because it was in the best sunny position, so it's had the best that we had to offer. Yeah, but I think I think that we didn't have enough we enough sunny weather this year for, for those to develop their true colours. And yet, on the opposite side, I had some ordinary corn for eating, and that ripened beautifully. Yeah. Oh, at least you can just blame the climate, blame the weather, <laughs> and you don't have to feel personally responsible, Lucy. Exactly. It's nothing to do with <laughs> Do you give over some space to edibles then? It is, um, you know, not, not exclusively flowers. I mean, at least you've got a bit of space, I suppose, to play with. I have. Um, it's the time I haven't got. I've got the space, but I don't have the time to do it all because I do actually do it on my own. Um, Gary's brilliant. He does all this fantastic building work, but gardening is, is my domain. Um, 
I do. This year, I didn't do quite as many vegetables as I did the previous year. During lockdown, we had loads of time. So I was doing that. But I think I'm wanting to push more vegetables again next year because I kind of missed some of that that lovely thing about pink. I did a few peas and beans and bits and bobs. I've just harvested some lovely squashes. Um, but I would like to do more. This winter, we're going to make we <laughs> Love that. Sorry, he's got something here. <laughs> which would be nice so yes I would like to do some edibles because I think it's really nice to, to have that combination and going back to the allotment I just love allotment gardens I like to see flowers and vegetables growing side by side and I don't really lo- even like to see a raised bed of one vegetable I like to see um, a raised bed with three or four vegetables and actually my my not my Indian gem corn but my other corn had some other bits and bobs growing up it so I like to have that combination I think it looks really pretty and I think aesthetically a vegetable stroke cutting garden is the prettiest garden for for me yeah Yeah. and and also because your arrangements are so vivacious I can well imagine some pretty funky veg making it into an arrangement well you know I always intended to but actually my veg is too ordinary (laughs) but it's not quite as pretty as I'd hoped um I had some amazing purple um kale which last winter just continued growing and growing it got to about seven foot tall it was amazing and if I'd actually had a big do on I could have made a really nice arrangement with that so yeah I mean some heritage beans would be nice I think next year so just some interesting colors and twiggles and yeah I think I think I will get around to it. I, that's my intention anyway, because I do this year. I did miss the quantity of vegetables, which we didn't do. Yeah. I mean, Alan, if anyone's looking for color inspiration on a veg plot, it, you kind of you do have that veg area at East Ruston Old Vicarage. But it is absolutely like singing and dancing with flowers at every possible corner. Well, yes. I mean, I think. I, I always tell the tale that, you know, visitors arrive at the garden and they think that we've got some kind of alchemy going on as if we know some kind of secret to, to, to growing flowers and vegetables together. But it's something that my grandparents always did. And um, it's something that I do now. And I think I think it does help. It brings pollinators into the into the veg plot. So, I mean, that helps from that point of view. And I always think that, you know, today we're all trying to garden organically and without the use of pesticides and things. And if you grow a greater variety of things together, then you'll get some, you know, you, you'll get some predators onto your pests as well as pests on your vegetables and things. So that helps. Um, bird boxes help too in the veg and cutting garden to bring in tits of all kinds because they're great predators on, on, on aphids. Um, but I think people think that we have some kind of secret when they come along and they see old fashioned pot marigolds or tajer teas um, or um, Limonanthes douglasii, you know, the poached egg plant growing amongst our, our veg. And I mean, it's purely and simply done because my family has always done that. And I think it gladdens the heart of the person who has to work in that garden. Um, and it pleases people when they pass by and, you know, nothing like it if you think about it you go well i'll just pop up to the vegetable garden i'll pick some beans peas or whatever carrots or something and then you could you know you find yourself tarrying a while shall we say (laughs) and you pick a little posy to bring in with you well that's lovely yeah definitely that's what it's all about i think is the more the merrier and it certainly works here because when i first started gardening i was gardening for other people and each bed of vegetables in one particular garden I'm thinking of it it was a monoculture on each bed but it didn't take long for the gentleman I worked for to cotton on to the idea of putting in a calendula like you say to jets or whatever and and gradually we could see it um an improvement in in plant health and yield and it was yeah it was already and that was we're going back to the 19 god 30 30 years ago when people didn't talk like that you know people didn't grow like that cover crops no one did cover crops um and so it's it's a really it's encouraging to see how horticulture is becoming more um, environmentally friendly i think it's quite quite it's quite something what you've just said lucy because i think if people only stop to think those that are old enough of the changes in horticulture in the last 30 years um which is to you not very long to me not very long but it is a long time um and i think it's astonishing the way things have moved yeah it it really is astonishing in actual fact 
the way I'm thinking now is is changing. I mycorrhizal. I'm a, do you use mycorrhizal? Yeah, I, I do. That I now use it's it's a relatively new thing for me. In fact, I've been reading a couple of books. I've just finished reading Finding the Mother Cat, Finding the Mother Tree. I've written it down by Suzanne Simard. A really good book talking about the mycorrhizal system of trees and just learning about how flipping everything we know upside down and what's going on under the soil is more important in many ways than what's going on above the soil. And actually that's a new area that I'm um, particularly interested in um, because my garden is a real mess and I leave it by the very last second before I start clearing it up. Um, and um, we do a no dig system here as well yeah. now. As well. And if people want to hear a bit more about uh, no dig obviously Charles Dowding has an amazing YouTube channel and Instagram page and everything but we did catch up with him on this podcast a few months back so you can uh, I'll link to that and also when it comes to soil uh, Professor Jane Rickson uh, who I sort of separately encountered in my my day job on the radio I am um, we sat down for a podcast with her just really getting down into the nitty-gritty about the composition of soil and all the different factors that are at play and that was fascinating so we'll link to that as well on the uh, video version so you can go and find them and obviously just search through our back catalog on the uh, the audio podcast if you are if you're listening to this rather than watching but there is so much and in the end soil health and looking after our soil is is absolutely critical yeah exactly we've just signed up um here in this village um with i think about 15 other landowners and we've been we've got a mere nine acres and a lot of them are farmers with 100 and 120 acres there's a chap behind us with 175 acres and we have all signed up to le letting everything go wild which is really amazing so um we, we for us that's not difficult because we're not a farm so we're quite happy watch uh, the fields that we've got here um are full of yellow rattle and so we are that our grass health is poor and that's a good thing if you want to encourage flowers and wildlife so our fields are full of butterflies at the moment and uh, well, not now but were full of butterflies and wildlife um i'm very proud to say that with my meter square i have i made this meter square frame and i go down onto the field and i count how much I've got in how many different species of wildflower and herbage that I've got in that and that's that's on the up I've got up to about 22 to 25 different different species which is really good but my point being is that um, even farmers around here I say even farmers it's really hard for farmers to to become as wild as they can be but by having these wild ribbons where we're going to all connect is is very um it's encouraging in quite a difficult, we're all in a quite a difficult position now, aren't we, environmentally? So if you are in a position to be able to do something which is positive, um, which we are trying to do here, um, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, we're trying to do that here. We are, we are letting areas um, rewild, in actual fact, just as you say. Um, but there has to be a certain amount of management, I think, otherwise you'll get one vigorous or aggressive species that takes over. Um, but it's it's nice to actually be able to do that and, and to support the fact that, you know, wildlife in our garden. When we first bought extra land from a farmer, and this must be 30 years ago, Lucy, when we cultivated that land, there were no earthworms in it. None at all. And it was three to five years before earthworms came back. But they, they did come back. But I don't know whether it was very deep, it, it was, they were discouraged by sprays or pesticides or very deep ploughing or what it was. But whatever it was, I mean, those sort of things have changed. And, and that's one of the things that's changed in the last 30 years, not just gardens, but also farming as well. And I think everybody's trying to do their bit, especially so here in Norfolk. Um, and lots of my friends are doing similar sorts of things. And um, I know that some people will say, well, you know, if you just leave one patch of nettles, that's not going to do that much good. It's not going to make that much difference. But if everybody does it, it must make a difference. It absolutely does. And it's the corridor thing. It's connecting one garden to the next with little bits of wildlife, or wild um, like nettles, or whatever, which makes a big difference. We went to a farm, part of this network of farms that we're all connecting to, um we went to and they have some devon reds about i think about 10 devon reds which as they call it do damage so they let them into the field and they 
do the damage, they break down young trees and they open up spaces and then they move them along. So there is there is a method in the madness of rewilding. Um, and the farm behind us, the two farms behind us, has just introduced beavers. So yeah. um, the beavers are going to slow down the rivers. So you have a river which is fast in areas and slow in other areas. So it can do what it's supposed to do. I mean, I don't purport to know an awful lot about it, apart from the fact that I am hugely on board with trying to do this rewilding and I think it's really important and the earthworm thing is important if you've got a garden and you're not sure the quality of your soil you just need to make a little hole and see how many worms you've got and that will give, be a very good indicator. With your wildflowers do you find when you get down there with your frame and you're analysing them are there things that have kind of appeared over the last 12 months or whatever that you're extra excited to have seen? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think how many years ago when we first did it, um, I think it was about 12 years ago, there was no red clover and a bit of white clover. Now we've got red clover and we've got vetch and we've got um, all, all sorts of bits and bobs. And so it's really, really nice. The other thing, of course, is we did actually introduce the yellow rattle. There was no yellow rattle and that's doing its job really, very well. In fact, a friend of ours who's got horses said, oh, I, we can't put your horses here on this field anymore. There's just nothing for them. It's there's hardly any grass. It's like, hooray. <laughs> we don't really need animals. We, I mean, there's plenty of fields around here for your cattle and for your horses. But for us here, it's for insects and creepy crawlies. <laughs> Bit easier well, and cheaper to manage than horses, to be honest. Oh, my God. Do you know how easy it is? You do nothing. <laughs> I love that. That's the that's the best way. Yeah, no, it's lovely. I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> oh, now, before we have to wrap things up, I and mean, this has just been a wonderful, fun, joyful chat. Uh, but before we do that, we always squeeze in some FLOMO. And from the sounds of things, as this conversation has gone on, I should think you probably have quite a lot of FLOMO to choose from, Lucy. Um, I am going to go first, inspired, actually, by uh, an amazing arrangement that you put up. It was very kind of colour coded and it seemed to have been inspired by different coloured sorbus berries. And you had kind of lime ones and orange ones and pink ones and they were laying along the bottom and then you had this fantastic combination of flowers that um echoed that color um kind of gradient in the arrangement yeah. itself and i don't have any sorbus i'm not entirely sure that rowan's would like my soil but it did give me a lot of sorbus flomo just seeing those different berries and then seeing how you'd sort of use that as an inspiration for an arrangement. I mean, I should think this time of year in particular, such inspiration when it comes to your arrangements. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, wild, the wild sorbets have done really well this year. Well, they certainly have in Devon. There is the, this, you get years where there's one thing that you drive, you go, you're driving through the lanes and you think, gosh, isn't that doing well this year? And this year it was sorbets. Every single sorbets tree, everywhere around here was so heavy with fruit um it was just beautiful absolutely beautiful um but yeah i think thank you that's very nice to hear um i have a, I've got one of them the yellow one um i forget what it is it was actually given to me as a really weedy little tree it's and it, they do, rock. yeah that's right jays and rock and and they it, they do really well really really well here but actually i think they do really well anywhere don't they I don't um, know. How are they? Too Good. There we go. I can have one. Mm. I think because actually, if they can grow here, they can grow anywhere. And they, they're tolerant of clay and they're tolerant of chalk, I think. Um, yeah, they're, they're a tough little tree. I just th I'm just thinking of a friend of mine called Annie who had a business selling uh, dried flower arrangements 30, 35 years ago. Um, and she had a farmhouse and she used to have a dehumidifier to dry the flowers and all that sort of thing. Um, and it was amazing what she did. It'd be very dated now, but it was amazing then. And one day I went over to see her and she had this her most amazing rowan tree with plum coloured berries on it. And I said, well, you must tell me what this tree is. And she said, it's my seedling. <laughs> <laughs> so she sowed some seed that somebody gave her. And that was the result. And I just think, you know, come on, have a go. It doesn't take that long. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That sounds amazing. Go. It was. 
<laughs> well, yeah, Rowan, Rowan's at this time of year. I'm having a lot of FLOMO over that. I should say, if you've never watched this podcast or listened to it, FLOMO is, is the kind of fear of missing out you get about a flower or a plant. It's just how we live our lives. So we thought we would introduce it to, uh, to the podcast. Um, Lucy, how, how are you going with things you want to grow? In the garden itself, I've always loved foxtail lilies. Can't grow those here. They actually like quite, I think they like um, a lighter soil, or they do like a lighter soil. So um, I'm always up against it. And then there is, um, oh, this is beautiful flower. Now I, I can't think of it. Alan, you might need to talk while I'm just thinking of this. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting that you can't grow Eremuris, which is the foxtail lilies, because we grow them in the desert wash here. And they, of course, that's what they like. They love those sort of hilly, rocky, stony, sandy places. And if you look at the root formation of, a, of an Eremiris, it, it, it's like a starfish going out. And I think where you see them growing quite naturally in the wild in Europe, they're clinging on to the side because, you know, they're growing quite steep uh, hillsides where it's windy. And those roots are anchors so that when the, the, the stem waves around like that, it's got guy ropes all around it, cl clinging it into the soil. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think the one thing we should say to people is try not to buy them as potted plants, because if you do, you'll find that somebody screwed all the root ball up and shoved it into a long tom or something like that, deep flower pot. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not growing in its natural way. So if you buy the dried tubers or whatever they're called roots um, and you plant them with the central nodule, which is the growing point, you plant that just about level or just peeping through the soil. They don't need deep planting, but they need to be spread out and they need to cover the ground so that they anchor the flower stems. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. They really don't like it here, though, because it is, I think it's not, it's just the whole environment. They just loathe it. And I literally take one out of the car and it'll die before it gets to the garden. <laughs> No. I heard it screaming, no, please <laughs> put me back. <laughs> I know, it doesn't, it really doesn't want to be here. Um, the Bascoms I absolutely adore. I've never had a lot of joy with them here. The ones that I particularly like, there's a little variety called Jackie. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's the most beautiful mauvey orange. I have this thing about mauve and orange together. I think it's really pretty. Um, I've, I've always coveted them and I remember going to a nursery saying look why is it my Vabascans they are they're lovely for in the first year but here here but they never come back and she said well you're living you live in Devon you know this is the lady who sold them to me by the way <laughs> said, what are you selling them to me for you live in Devon. Said, they do so well in Norfolk <laughs> was quite different it's like well why on earth are you selling me them because every year I'd spend quite a lot of money on, on having a whole line at the front of the house because it looks particularly pretty, the colourway there. And uh, then the next year, they'd never come back. So things like that are always so frustrating. And I'm sure everybody is, is in that situation where you find a beautiful flower, you love it, and you try again and again and again, and it's, it just doesn't come back. And you have to learn just to get on with it and, you know, <laughs> give up. Well, the going's good. And go back to the roses. <laughs> yeah, go back to the things that you know do do well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've all been there. You know, at first you don't succeed. Try, try and try again until you realise wrong plant, wrong place. <laughs> exactly. We can't have it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alan, where are you at with your FLOMO this week? Well, my FLOMO, FLOMO, FLOMO even, <laughs> harks back to our Chelsea Flower Show vi visit. Um, because I've been working an awful lot with succulents, um, in Thordish, you'll know what I'm going to say, probably. Um, but I've been working a lot with my succulents because we have big displays of succulents on benches outside underneath windows, sort of step, step benches, and so we can display them nicely. Um, and by the end of the year, they sometimes get a little bit too tall and I need to cut them back, or they need splitting and dividing, and I, that's what I've been doing. Um, and I started to think about the new... Um, plants that we've got, which is a cross between a Sempervivum and, a, and an Aeonium, and they are called Semponiums. And these are exciting things, and they come from your neck of the woods, I think, somewhere down there in Cornwall Penzance. Way, yeah. Penzance, the next county along. They're indoor plants. I mean, I used to have Aeoniums outside, but I'd always bring them in in the winter, and then they'd always fail because I never really looked after them. 
Yeah, but Lucy, this is the point. The, 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 what they've been doing at um, Surreal Succulents is they've crossed a Semper Vivum, which is a house leak, with mm. an Aeonium, and hopefully that will make the Aeonium half of the Semponium be much oh. hardier. And they look, right. they look like Aeoniums, although they've got Semper Vivum blood in them, if you like, or shall we say sap? <laughs> my, flow, my flomo is that there's there's four new varieties um, being released by surreal succulents next year and i must right. have those in my collection just to see how they wow. how they grow how big do they get um they, they don't get quite so tall as an aeonium will and they're more sort of humping so that if you have a, a, a large bowl that you can fill with uh you just will start with, with one plant then it will have lots of rosettes around the edge and then they have in turn have lots of room and so the whole thing builds up until until you've got a thriving colony yeah wonderful gosh how that that sounds beautiful yeah, Alan and I have, have talked quite a lot about these and I find every single time we talk about them, the more tempted I am to succumb because uh, I'm trying my front garden. I, I try and not water it very much. And um, and so I feel like I need more succulents in there because obviously they will, you know, they will relish once they're established and happy. If they can be hardy and they can get baked by the sun and not need watering, that'd be marvellous. So every time you talk about it, I'll just edge that <laughs> bit closer to putting an order in. <laughs> Are they paying you money, Alan? No, not at all. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> um, Lucy, thank you so much for giving us so much inspiration and, uh, and allowing us a window into the, the kind of genius behind Johnny Crow's Garden because so many of us follow your exploits, but we don't always get to see you because it's always your arrangements and bouquets and headdresses and all kinds of fabulous things, but not enough of you. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm not going on those squares. <laughs> I'm trying to create beauty here. <laughs> but thank you for well, this. Just so you know, if you're listening to the audio version of this, that Lucy is very much, you know, you've got the model thing going on. You're this six foot, lots of lovely blonde hair. And you keep saying things like, I've been gardening for 30 years, which doesn't seem possible um, <laughs> considering what you look like. So if you've got the Dorian Gray portrait in the attic or whatever you're using, I want it. <laughs> you are silly. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> Lucy, thank you very much. Will you come back again another time? I would love to. I would love to. We look forward to it. For the meantime, in the between time, happy gardening and we look forward to seeing more of your fantastic flowers on your instagram thank you very thank much you very much lucy bye-bye happy gardening <laughs> what i'm going to do this is all mod cons you're sellotaped to my old makita radio <laughs> see good old sellotape <laughs> i'm sellotaping you back up again <laughs> I've told Gary, Gary has just come in. I've just, just said to him, you can't walk behind me and put your trousers on. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's promised me he'll be decent. <laughs> I warn you, there is a blooper section at the end and that may end up in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Gary? <laughs> hey.